a chance for you to be before the committee and to talk about uh, our business and the important work that we do here in the Congress as we prepare for a vote tomorrow. And as always, uh, we'll, without objection, we'll accept uh, your uh, words that you wish to put in the record. And if you wish to summarize or give us uh, your testimony now, uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin uh, is recognized. Uh, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Chairman. Yeah, I'll just ask unanimous consent that it be included in the record. Uh, I am here on behalf of uh, my chairman, Chairman Camp, of the Ways and Means Committee. As, as you know, this is in the jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee, so that's the hat I am wearing here. Uh, this legislation accomplishes two things. Uh, it provides a short-term increase uh, in the debt limit to get us through May 19th of this year, and it ties the debt limit increase uh, to our budget process. It provides that if each House of Congress has not passed a budget resolution by the statutory deadline of April 15th, members' pay will be withheld until that House passes a budget. Uh, this is based on the Cooper bipartisan uh, legislation of the 112th Congress. Uh, I wish we weren't here in this position. Uh, the reason for this short-term extension is to just get Congress to actually follow the law that Congress wrote in 1974, which is to pass a budget by April 15th. We're not saying what kind of budget they have to pass, just pass a budget. Reason is, the Senate is going on four years now for not having passed a budget. We think uh, this gives us the time we need in this nation to have a good, thorough, vigorous, and honest debate about what it takes to get our fiscal house in order and about how to budget. Families budget, businesses budget, our federal government should budget. We actually have a law that says we should budget. All we're saying is follow that law, and that's why the short-term extension before you today. I'll let the rest of it speak for itself. Thank you very much. Mr. Levin? First, uh, welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I think this is the first time I've been before you, any of us have, with you in the chair. Well, thank you very much. I hope I do well enough where you'll want to come back. <laughs> I'll come back whether I want to or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we still welcome you being here. And by the way, for both of all three of you, please note we have several new members uh, down all the way at the end, the gentleman, Dr. Mike Burgess, uh, Chairwoman Ileana Roslayton, and then the uh, young member from Oklahoma, Tom Cole, who is uh, coming back on the committee, and we're, we're delighted. We hope that we, once again, uh, greet you with the respect that uh, we do uh, this Ways and Means Committee, the House Administration Committee. So we'll see if thank we can you. change your opinion a little bit. No, and thank you very much, and welcome to the new members, including one young veteran who has chaired another committee. Let me be very brief because we've been through this before. In the summer of 2011, um, 2011, uh, the House majority here toyed with the debt ceiling. And the ramifications were, I think, not only s serious but severe um, in terms of job creation August of 2011 was the worst in the last three years uh, the market plunged uh, in those two months 2,000 points and it had in that period the worst single day drop in history on August 8th. It was looking at uh, my notes, so I'm very exact, 635 points. The Treasury was forced to spend well over a billion in interest payments, and I think we all remember so vividly uh, that uh, there was a downgrading of our credit rating. So, a postponement of three or four months uh, has more than the potential of some very serious consequences. And so we urge very much that as this committee considers this bill, that you uh, remember uh, what happened before only 18 months ago. Uh, and. Um, I think using the debt ceiling for leverage 
is a mistake. I'll finish with this because we were at the Ways and Means Committee and I gave the opening statement. And one of the witnesses talked about Grand Rudman. It was attached to a debt ceiling bill. Um, I was among the Democrats who voted for it. Uh, but it passed, it was deemed passed in the House. And the debt ceiling bill was used by senators as a vehicle, not as a threat. And not for leverage, but as a vehicle to attach deficit reduction. So the use of the debt ceiling for the purpose that is ascribed to this one it does not have a history that supports its use for this purpose. And so to the extent that you have the ability to look at this issue, I would urge that uh, this is not only a dangerous precedent, uh, but a very likely problem for the economy when we need to emphasize economic growth and jobs. So I say that uh, in a somewhat uh, sober way uh, because of what happened before. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to welcome Mr. Brady, uh, former chairman of the House Administration Committee, who has joined us today, and our new chairman, uh, Chairwoman Candace Miller, uh, would be recognized at this time. Chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I also am delighted to see you sitting in the seat there, and welcome to the new members of the Rules Committee. I feel like i got Florida covering my back uh, over here, but uh, yeah, I always get your back. Uh, and I'm delighted to sit uh, next to my uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Sandy Levin. Interestingly enough, Sandy and I actually share a county, Macomb County. Sometimes you hear that term, the Reagan Democrats. The term had its uh, genesis in the political nomenclature from our county. So you have two, you know, you all know our politics, you have two very divergent beliefs coming out of a county. Uh, but one thing that is a, a very commonality, I think, of uh, a county like Macomb is uh, we, uh, we have budgets. We pass budgets on time. Uh, we balance them. And uh, uh, we just think you should have a budget. Uh, interestingly enough, just before I came here, before we had our vote series, I was doing something I call Congress in the classroom where I... I, I was going to call it Skype, but it's actually the new technology, Azuvo. So I'm using Azuvo to uh, uh, talk to all of these uh, kids in my district, my part of the county, uh, about uh, things that are going on in Congress. And uh, uh, I was telling them about this particular piece of legislation that was going to come before the Congress tomorrow and, and told them, you know, that the, that the Senate had actually not passed a budget in, in almost four years. And they said, well, how could that be? You know, isn't there anything you can do to force that? And I said, well, we're going to try uh, tomorrow, and it's unfortunate it has come to that. But, you know, whatever kind of budget the Senate would pass, obviously the House Republicans probably would uh, very vehemently disagree with it. However, it's a way to begin a negotiation and where you're not negotiating with yourself. And I think uh, most uh, folks, whether you're uh, whatever business you might be involved in or a government entity or your own household, a budget is a blueprint. It is a blueprint for uh, a path forward. Uh, to your spending priorities and, and how you proceed. So um, I think that this piece of legislation that will be on the floor uh, tomorrow, and I appreciate all the work done by uh, my colleagues on Ways and Means uh, on this, is an important piece of legislation, and I just came to add my voice uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, and associate myself with the remarks of my colleague, uh, Mr. Ryan. But I would also mention uh, the caveat uh, that has gotten a, a bit of attention uh, is the no-pay clause uh, without having a, a, the Senate or the House uh, either respective uh, chamber not pass the budget and whether or not that uh, meets the uh, constitutionality the confines of the 27th Amendment. I'm not a constitutional attorney. I'm not an attorney of any type. Uh, but uh, we've, uh, we've uh, our, our committee uh, has looked at this uh, quite a bit <clears throat> on our side. We think that uh, placing the um, members pay in escrow until such time as uh, that particular chamber passes a budget uh, is constitutional, meets the constitutionality uh, of the uh, 27th Amendment, uh, as, as long as we uh, the member actually is paid uh, by the end of the 113th Congress. 
Uh, there's been some questions. Somebody asked me uh, just on the floor, actually, whether or not, for instance, if you weren't uh, accum let's let's say uh, you know the X amount of times passed before the uh, payment uh, uh, would be made, whether or not the Congress should be uh, accru whether or not the escrow account would be accruing interest uh, for the members, and if the interest was not accrued, would that be uh, a problem with the 27th Amendment? But uh, interest on any kind of federal spending in, in, in escrow or whatever. Uh, uh, has to be done by a specific statute, and there is nothing in the statute for the 27th Amendment to require that. So I think uh, I feel I feel very confident that the 27th Amendment and the constitutionality of that would be upheld uh, with the bill that the uh, House will be focusing on tomorrow. And uh, I look forward uh, to its passage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Brady. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member, congratulations to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Oh, I will miss Mr. Dreyer. <laughs> but I'm sure that you, I'll... You sound a lot like Mr. Levin. <laughs> he wanted David Dreyer back. Oh, no, I, 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 I think I can... I think I can get along with you, too. <laughs> but he was, uh, he was fun to watch. He was. And I got along with him well, and I liked him. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe the Congress needs to raise the debt ceiling to honor our commitments to our seniors, our veterans, and that raising the debt ceiling is only about paying bills that we already racked up. I also believe that the best way to achieve these goals is through a long-term balanced approach. It is not yet clear to me if this bill is a viable vehicle to achieve those goals. I, unlike my, 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 my chairman, uh, have not had a long enough time to look at this. Our committee hasn't had a long enough time. We just got it this morning. So as you know, we just received it. And yesterday, and, I'm sorry, yesterday, considering it deals with how we fund the government, and potentially raises constitutional questions, I think it deserves a serious look. As we continue to review its provisions, I hope this committee will grant an open rule so that we will think these improvements, so we can see if these improvements need to be made, we will have the opportunity to do so. House administration is responsible for the members' pay, component of this, uh, main, main component of this proposal. Among our concerns is the constitutionality how this section is drafted. We all know the 27th Amendment prohibits varying whether or not this is a varying or not. Again, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I'm not a lawyer either of any kind, and I do not apologize for that. Uh, but the member's compensation yet in this proposal may do just that. It's unclear whether what pay is withheld, how this impacts other benefits, and, and a host of other considerations. As we continue to review the bill and its possible implications, we may need to improve the legislation. The only way you can accomplish that is by adopting an open rule and I encourage this committee to grant one, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Brady. Uh, I have heard two overwhelming questions uh, come up here today, and uh, one is, Mr. Ryan, which I would ask you this question, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Levin, really alludes to the uncertainty that's caused in the marketplace. Uh, and it was my real recollection, without studying this very clearly, that I think what the markets and the ana analysis of that said was there's great damage if you don't address the issue as opposed to going through a deliberative process where both sides or all three sides deal with each other effectively to get it done. Yeah. What would be your take on, uh, well, on this issue? Having met with the rating agencies themselves and the people who make these decisions at the rating agencies, it wasn't the fact that we were having the debate that was the problem. It was the fact that the debate, you know, would not result in fiscal consolidation, as they would call it. Uh, let me take point you to evidence of Fitch. Fitch is a rating agency that just recently put out a, a negative downgrade warning, which said it's not that Congress is going to have a debate. It's that the political system isn't working to result in fiscal consolidation and getting spending and borrowing and debt and deficit under control. It's that this may not materialize in, in a result where we actually get our debt and deficits under control. And if we don't do that, then we'll probably have a downgrade. So it's not the fact that we have political theater or a rancorous debate. It's the fact that if that doesn't result in us doing something to get a down payment on debt reduction, then we'll have the downgrade. What they're doing is they're looking at the projections of our fiscal imbalance, the fiscal gap, as they call it. And if nothing results from this, because they conclude that the, fisc that the political system is broken, then they'll give us a downgrade. So I would argue it's really the mechanics and the math of our fiscal problem and the, and the lack of a will to deal with that or results coming out of this place to deal with that is what is creating these downgrades. 
Uh, have you analyzed or paid attention what the president would like for us to do on this, what his position is, Mr. Ryan? Yeah, well, we've obviously had talks with the Treasury Department of the White House, and, and we've seen the president's comments. He wanted uh, to have just the limit raised indefinitely was his original position uh, during uh, the, the negotiations at the end of the last year. Uh, so he doesn't want Congress to have this authority. Obviously, we believe that this is clearly authority that resides with Congress, power of the purse. Uh, second point is what we're doing here is we are giving the administration the ability to meet the nation's obligations while we have the time to consider budgets. We have statutory deadlines. The president is supposed to submit his budget the first Monday in February. He's missing that deadline clearly according to the president's uh, budget people. Congress is supposed to pass a budget by April 15th, the House and the Senate, in order to accommodate those deadlines so that we can actually have a, a, a very important, vigorous debate about how best to solve this fiscal gap. We need the time to do that, and that's what this does. Mr. Ryan, do you believe that it's uh, in the best interest of uh, this country for one or two people to be at the table to solve this, or rather a more open process? That's the other point we, 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 we wish to make. This is not something where you're going to fix the nation's immense fiscal problems with some backroom deal. We want to get back to what we commonly refer to around here as regular order. We think we should deliberate. We think we should go through the committee process. We think we should produce budgets that show how we intend to fix this fiscal problem and prevent a debt crisis. A debt crisis hurts everybody. The people who need government the most, the poor, the elderly, the sick, that's who gets hurt the first and the worst in a debt crisis. Because if you have a debt crisis, then you're cutting spending indiscriminately across the board. Then interest rates go up. Then people have a harder time affording their car, their student loan, their mortgage. Those are the problems that come if you have a debt crisis like that which is now plaguing Europe. This is what we seek to prevent. And what we want to do is go through regular order where every member of Congress has their voice heard so that their committee and then their, 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 their party whether the Republicans in the House or the Republicans in the Democrat, Democrats in the Senate in the House, they can produce a budget which we pass to show the art of governing. The 1974 Budget Act is very clear. There's a lot of parts of this act I don't like. This one I do. It says you've got to pass a budget. Congress, the government, should operate on a budget. We haven't had one for four years, and it's because the Senate has chosen not to pass one. We believe we need to get back to the art of budgeting, and have it through regular order, and that's what this does. This buys us the time in order to do that so we can have the kind of debate that Fitch and the rating agencies are telling us we need to have. How are we going to fix this problem? How are we going to prevent a debt crisis? How are we going to make sure that we don't leave our children and grandchildren with a burden of debt that will suffocate their futures? Mr. Ryan, today you represent the Ways and Means Committee. However, you sit as the chairman of the Budget Committee for the House of Representatives. Is it your intent to move forward to do the same that we would be asking another body to do, and that is produce a budget? It is my intent. As you know, debt limit is jurisdiction of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, it is my intent, as, it, as I did last two years, is to produce a budget in that budget committee, bring it to the floor, and pass it. Uh, I did that each of the last two years in fulfillment of the 1974 Budget Act, and we anticipate doing the same thing again. Well, on behalf of uh, myself, I would say, as a fellow committee chairman, I applaud you for doing the hard work. Uh, I've been on the budget committee, served with you in the budget committee, and it's it's a lot of uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of long hours, but it produces things that give people confidence that we're addressing those things. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Mrs. Miller. Uh, if I could ask you, I've heard uh, our two colleagues uh, from the other side of the aisle really kind of uh, allude to this five-page bill that we have before us today uh, that I have read several times and. Uh, I think I understand it, but wouldn't it be true to say that the Senate would have to agree to this if it were going to become something that they would have to live by? So in other words, this is a document which we're producing. Has to go to the Senate. So if they have problems with it, then they would take up that uh, issue and deliberate that. We're not, in essence, laying off on another body our own wishes. We're rather stating what we would like to do, and we're placing ourselves in the same position that we would be placing someone else. Would that be true? Placing ourselves in the position to follow the law. Good. And also uh, and perform. If the Senate uh, passes it, they will be uh, following the law as well, which 
again, they've not done so in the last four years uh, by not having a budget. And, uh, uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, without naming any names, but, you know, you read some of the articles here uh, where a number of the members of the uh, Senate, uh, Democrats in particular, have said this is a great opportunity for them to pass a budget, to talk about tax reform or various kinds of things, the debt ceiling, the sequestration, et cetera, that have not really been addressed appropriately uh, for the nation. So uh, I, I think that is a, a good way to look at it. It is an opportunity uh, to uh, follow the law and, uh, and do our jobs. And thank you very much. See, I agree with you. And I think both sides uh, of this capital will have an opportunity to accept this uh, bill, vote for it or against it, but to be able to debate it and the merits there within. And I think I have seen where several prominent uh, Democrats have really accepted uh, the challenge uh, to get that done. Mr. Levin, did you want to? Well, just my briefly, name? my yes. guess is we'll, Gentleman's de recognized. we'll debate this tomorrow. Uh, just a few things. Uh, I'm in favor of regular order. Uh, that doesn't mean there's any guarantee of the result. And to use the debt ceiling as a lever, I think, is a very serious mistake. <coughs> After the um, credit of this country was downgraded, a senior director of Standard & Poor's, this was right after it, said the following about uh, American political institutions, that uh, they were undermined, I quote, that people in the political arena were even talking about a potential default. And essentially, this bill does that. And if I might say to Mr. Ryan, we're on the same floor. We, we talk to each other a lot anyway. Um, I think it would be helpful in regular order if there were a budget brought to the floor of the House that had bipartisan support and was a product of regular order with strong bipartisan support in the rule, in, in the budget committee and on the floor. Thank you. Thank you very we, much. We look forward to your support. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Ryan, a, participation. A, a new issue has just been brought up by the gentleman, and that is perhaps the timing. Do you believe that this is timely and that you've given people an opportunity rather than waiting until the last minute and us getting to a deadline and then having to react? Yeah, Mr. Levin and I are friends. And we, oh, uh, he and I are friends. Come with him. Um, our intention, as before, is to write a committee mark bring it to the committee, uh, entertain probably up to 40 or so amendments, uh, some of which we've taken in the past, and then to bring a product out of committee. Uh, there may be irreconcilable differences, but then the minority has, we will, we will fight here at Rules Committee to give them the opportunity to present a substitute budget if they don't like ours. And that to us is regular order. Uh, that's the way things ought to be. And I would love to see. There was um, one budget that did get bipartisan votes. It didn't get many votes, but it was Cooper and Latourette and a few others. So there were some bipartisan votes. They got like 30 or 35 votes or something like that. But So that, that happened in this last Congress. Um, I hope it happens in this Congress. But there may be a moment where we just have irreconcilable differences on how best to solve these problems. But at least we're talking about how to solve these problems. At least in the House, we brought budgets. Mr. Van Hollen, to his credit, brought a budget and brought it to the floor, to his credit. That didn't happen in the Senate. They didn't even attempt to do that. So here in the House, Democrats and Republicans have been leading by offering budgets and offering alternatives. The Senate hasn't even done that. All we're saying is, let's get the Senate in the game here to do that so that we can debate about how to fix the problem, not whether we're going to even try to fix the problem. Mr. Chairman, I've been handed a note saying I need to go to another uh, form. I, I um, recognize would that. You, would you excuse me? woman, uh, Mrs. Slaughter, hears that, and I assume that. I should be there, too. And we. Yeah, I'm next. I'll, I'll talk long I, so that you <laughs> return is up after my. Well, well let, 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 let me ask very quickly if someone has a, a question for Mr. Levin before he goes. And. Anyone? You have to leave this minute. Yeah. All right. Then I will not stand in the way. 
I think you'll give me leave, and the chairman will. Well, as always, we want to reserve the right, as we agree with you, to at least give our members an equal okay. shot. And I see no member necessarily that has a question. I'll, I'll try to come back if you're still in Well, the, the, the gentleman will be considered excused at this okay. point then. Thank Mrs. you. Mrs. Fox? I will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate very much um, the uh, resolution, uh, the bill that's been brought to us today. And uh, I, I don't really want to repeat or ask uh, Chairman Ryan or um, Chairwoman Miller to repeat the things that they've said, but I do think it's important that we highlight the fact that the House, under Republican leadership, has been adopting a budget. We have the last two years, and that the Senate has not, and that there is a law that says we are to adopt a budget. Uh, Chairman Ryan pointed out that the President's folks have said they will not adhere to the law again this year. As my recollection is they were late last year. I think they submitted a budget, but my recollection is that they were late last year. I may be not correct on that. Yeah, you're talking about the administration, correct? Yeah, they submitted, yeah. Uh, they submitted a budget. They missed the deadline off three out of four times. Okay. So I think what's important here is we are the lawmakers and that it's important that we be good role models for the rest of the country. And um, we certainly are castigated on an individual level when we break the law. Some, some people have, some inadvertently, some um, uh, purposefully. But I think it's very important that we um, follow the law. And so I think it's important that we continue to point this out to the American people. And um, I'm very pleased that we're going to be doing this. Raising the debt ceiling is a very, very serious issue. And um, we don't do this lightly. Nobody, I think, should do it lightly. And I, I believe that the, the way we are going to be doing this will help us uh, move forward with working on the budget. I think you don't get the baseline numbers to win, Mr. Ryan. Uh, the CBO is late because of the end of the year fiscal issues. They anticipate getting their January baseline updated on February 4th. Typically, you write a budget resolution off of CBO's rescore of the President's submitted budget. The President's budget is coming late. The administration has not said when they're going to submit a budget, so we don't know when CBO will have the opportunity to score it. it. Usually takes about three weeks to score it. Then you get your final baseline with what you normally write your budget. So that's, that's the issue here uh, of timing. But since CBO will give us their newer baseline, we call it the January baseline, in February, that gets us something to start with. And I read an article the other day that says that one of the things that resulted um, as it has come about as a result of what we did um, January 1st, I guess it was, uh, was that we now should not be having arguments about baseline. That we hope that's been cleared up and that that will be a useful thing to have going forward. Um, I know it's been a very difficult thing for you to explain and for me to explain sometimes to people. But I, I just want to applaud you all for what you're doing and I uh, want to thank Chairwoman uh, Miller for coming. And Mr. Brady, it's always nice to see you. Thank you very much. I yield back. Ms. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put the administration's statement policy in Without the record. Without objection. Um, and, you know, we all started out with everybody's friends and you're all friends with Sandy, and we're all friends with each other, and I want to be your friend. But i got to tell you, friends, I'm not sure what it is we're doing here today. Uh, this was filed yesterday morning at 7 o'clock on Inauguration Day. I, we all read the crowd, at least I read the Krauthammer article, which I assume was, from all, uh, everything I've heard, was the father of this idea. Um, and... But the fact is the Democrat Party has been totally left out of this. We, we, we keep going down the road here sort of lurching and jerking about, uh, sort of like Plan B, 
uh, leaving us out, calling us up to the Rules Committee where we all sit up here, uh, sitting up higher than everybody else, uh, looking as though we uh, really know what's going on. We really uh, have about had it. There is nothing like called regular order here. We talk about it all the time. Uh, we talk about budgets being law. We wave the budget resolution up here every single week almost. And, you know, that's the law as well. But this this is a step too far for me. I really think what, what you're doing here, while I, I appreciate as, as well as I think everybody else on my side of the committee, that the idea of dollar for dollar business seems to be gone. We're glad for that. I'm not really clear. It's sort of a lottery, I think. We passed the law over here, and we think that the Senate will pass the same bill. Is that is that the idea? We believe that will happen? That's how the legislative process works. The House passes a bill, and the Senate acts. And, and if they don't act in kind, committee. you go to a conference committee. Well, there's been no committee hearings, no public hearing, no discussion. Uh, Democrats need there's a hearing right now on Ways and Means on this. You didn't know it. Um, and I'm assuming you've not had those conversations with the Senate. We have. Um, this bill came from um, a member of your side of the aisle, Mr. Cooper. Um, and it came, the decision was before that article you referred. I read that same editorial yeah. after we had decided this was the better course of action. We thought that um, the bipartisan bill uh, that Mr. Cooper, a, a Democrat, authored um, was a sound way forward. And that's why we included the Cooper legislation with his short-term debt limit extension. But the, given the importance of this, I, I just would like to know what kind of uh, negotiations you've had with the Senate. Well, we don't know if the Senate will accept the pass this or not. Um, I, I got the same sap you just got, which well, says that the administration what, what, supports that, a short-term extension. the administration, but the Senate has yeah. to pass the same bill. We don't know the answer to that. They, they, have they been discussed? Uh, yeah, they've been, been sent the legislation, but I don't know what the Senate will do. But that's so I think that happens fairly often. Since you're going to be heading this up? Well, I don't know that if we, every bill we pass through here, we first have to wait for the Senate to say that they will support it and then we pass it. I don't think that's how the legislative process works. I think Let's we pass legislation, but sometimes we don't know whether the Senate will pass it or not. I, that, I think that's, well, I think we're down to the Alice in Wonderland piece right here. And we keep pretending the legislative process is working. And, but you and I know, both know that it is not. Something like this, we would have had committee. Yeah, the goal of this is to get the legislative process this with working. With the other side of the party, you know, we are perfectly willing, even eager here, as part of the Congress of the United States, to be a part of what you're doing. Yeah, that's but we never know. It's sort of dropped in on us, parachuted in from some place, uh, telegraphed in the newspaper, maybe. Uh, but our, our participation in this, now, as I understand it. Um, we were sort of talking by ourselves. We didn't quite understand the pay piece. Uh, if we pass a budget, House members get paid. Is that right? That's right. E each chamber uh -huh. has a responsibility to pass a budget through their chamber. And the, Senate and the pay is an escrow uh, uh -huh. until they do that uh -huh. after the statutory deadline. So it, the houses will be treated. Uh -huh. The House is in control of its own mm -hmm. fate, the Senate of theirs. So the frustration that is expressed in this legislation is the fact that our federal government has gone without a budget for almost four years. Is that the Senate, yes, and, your party's control the Senate. important. Uh, it's, the the, budget, it's that the Senate has chosen well, we're talking not about to even pass a budget for about here. four we're years. We're not talking about the budget. You've no, but that's what that this legislation does. Limit. All right, you've, you've done that. And this legislation but, is authored by a Democrat here in the House. The fact of the matter is that there has been no regular order on this. And we've gotten used to, we just went through Plan B. There was no re regular order on that. And you know how that turned out. You remember Plan, are you talking being, about the fiscal cliff? Oh, the fiscal okay. cliff, right. right. That's it. There are other Plan Bs, but I understand you didn't allude to There are to a lot of Plan B. Bs, so I just right. want to know okay. which one you were talking about. Um, so I, I just, we, we would, let me reiterate that we would be more than happy to join in your process here. Maybe even give you a great idea every now and then. Maybe something we could all work together on once again. The House of Representatives would be the people's house. And all the people sent to serve here would be able to participate in it. We long for that day. I hope, right? I appreciate that. We I hope you, I hope you, I had a conversation with Mr. Cooper this morning, which was, we saw a Democrat with a piece of legislation that we thought was a good idea. Mm -hmm. That's why this includes that legislation. Well, it would have been nice, I guess, maybe some of the rest of us had heard about well, it. Uh, we, we would have don't know what appreciated to say about that. that. But I, there's not much we can say about this today. I'm, Assuming you've already got the votes that you can pass it, uh, and certainly it will go out of here okay. 
But uh, I, I really must say in the strongest terms that I can, the idea of continually coming up here and sitting here uh, with something that was just handed to us and trying to pretend that we're part of the process here, is, I, I just can't do that anymore. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. In, in defense of me asking you three or four, as it were, to come up here, I'm delighted that we did this now rather than waiting until the very end. Because, Mr. Ryan, I don't even know, you don't have to respond to this, but I don't even know if we know what day we have to have it ready. And so I viewed that as committee chairmen were speaking with each other, including our Republican leadership, that we were trying to do the correct, correct. thing and to make sure the administration read us as clear, this is not a poison pill. This would be something that the Senate would have to agree to, and public comments out of the Senate by Senate Democrats have indicated a willingness to accept Right. It. That's one of the reasons why we're doing it now, because we don't want to bring it to brinksmanship. Uh, that's why I think the President's um, SAP, the Statement of Administration Policy, we use acronyms around here, speaks to that. Uh, we don't know when what they call the X date is, meaning a date when the borrowing authority runs out once Treasury has exhausted its extraordinary measures that they're employing right now. It's estimated that that occurs sometime between February 15th and March 15th, but we don't know when that is. We don't want to test it. That's why we're doing this now. Well, I applaud Chairman Camp and you and each of you for being here today. Mr. Cole? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. Just uh, one question to any of you that might care to take it up. I have heard a number of people express concerns about the constitutionality of the pay provision, and I know, Chairman, that you've looked into that, but I invite any, either of the other two uh, gentlemen, if they'd care to comment as well. But you have, can you elaborate on that a little bit, what kind of research you've done to assure yourself that this is within the Constitution? We'll preface my statement by again reminding you I'm not a constitutional attorney, but that, that, I have my notes from my constitutional attorneys. That gives me much more confidence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, you know, James Madison obviously proposing the 27th Amendment in 1789, and, and, uh, and I've had the attorneys go through, and they, uh, they agree, our, our, our side, anyway, of the attorneys agree that uh, it generally applies to varying, varying being the operative phrase of the compensation. They actually, I thought it was interesting, they looked at a couple of sites of uh, various, a uh, couple of lawsuits been before the Supremes on this uh, on this issue. Uh, <clears throat> one was um, about the COLA provisions, uh, that the Congress automatically gets uh, some uh, increases, et cetera. Uh, and there was another one that was brought by a Congressman, Bob Schaefer, some of you might recall him, that was before my time, uh, on the grounds that, um, uh, let's see, Bah, 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 the 27th Amendment. Anyway, at any rate, I don't go through all the weeds on that, but uh, it, again, spoke to the varying, and they uh, decided that uh, varying the compensation is really the, uh, uh, the operative phrase, as I say, with that. So our attorneys <coughs> uh, in, uh, in the House Admin on our side uh, agree that there is no violation of the 27th Amendment as long as you uh, pay members uh, at the end uh, by the end, I should say, by the end of the uh, 113th Congress. Uh, or, obviously, we'd like to have this uh, negated completely by having the Senate uh, pass a budget, the House pass a budget, the Senate pass a budget, as is required by law and on time. So, uh, as I've talked to them, I feel uh, pretty good about the constitutionality of the 27th Amendment and how it applies to this. And, and I would just, if I could, uh, just make a couple of other comments. I do think it's interesting that, uh, in a spirit of bipartisanship, uh, as you've pointed out, this was actually a, a piece of legislation for the most part, pretty much mirrors what was uh, uh, introduced in the 112th uh, with, uh, by a Democrat uh, with uh, several other Democratic co-sponsors as well as Republicans here. So I, I sort of feel like this is an effort at a bipartisan uh, uh, bipartisanship. And, and uh, uh, I know Sandy had to leave, but he was talking about the ratings agencies and and what happened when we were downgraded uh, during the last uh, debt ceiling uh, debate. And I thought it was interesting reading the uh, executive management report from the ratings agency uh, that uh, also pointed to the Congress uh, that one of the reasons, a huge reason for the downgrade, because they didn't feel that the Congress had the uh, political will to address the spending uh, crisis that we are in either. So that was also a big part of the uh, downgrade of our credit rating. And uh, now I think, uh, you know, we are trying to exercise 
uh, the political will to uh, address our, our spending uh, by having a budget, which you can't really talk about appropriation bills and all of these kinds of things. In my mind, having continuing resolutions to fund the government forever is uh, unsustainable. And uh, uh, you need to pass a budget to begin uh, with a foundation. Mr. Cole, I, I also talk to attorneys, our attorneys, and some other attorneys, not just with our staff. <clears throat> and I tell them, talk to me like I can understand you, because they start talking too much legalese. And what they actually told me, what I asked them is, if I get a paycheck in my account every month, and now I don't get that paycheck in my account till whenever it may come at the end of the year, that's varying. And they, their opinion, that could be, they didn't say it was, but they said could be that that could violate the 27th Amendment because we're varying something. Not coming this month, coming at the end of the year. The other thing I, I would like to just don't understand is that, and I'm going to tell you like I think and how it is, we're kind of like trying to not punish but penalize the other side, the, uh, the Senate, because they haven't acted. So what we're doing is last drafting legislation that's going to make our side, whether we pass it, maybe sometimes not pass a budget, and we're going to punish, not punish, maybe penalize our side by not getting a payroll or a paycheck until the end of the year. Now, I, I'm probably not, I think I'm talking maybe by just my own knowledge. I don't think that hurts any of the United States senators, but it may hurt one of our 435 members here because some of them I know maybe have to make a mortgage payment, maybe have to make a car payment, maybe have to make a uh, insurance payment or some type of payment, and they may not be able to talk to their bank or whoever it may be and say, can you wait to the end of the year? I can show you my escrow account. So I'm wondering who we're penalizing here, you know, and I probably think we'll pass a budget in the House, so maybe this might not happen to us, but I don't think it's going to bother the other side too much. I mean, that's my opinion. Mr. Ryan, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, well, just to stay for the record, it's not meant to punish people for past behavior. This is meant to get Congress back to doing its job, to simply following the law to budgeting. We have a fiscal crisis. We are racking up trillion-dollar deficits. This is not a Republican against Democrat thing. It's a math thing. This debt crisis is coming because of the debt that is piling up. All the independent fiscal authorities tell us this. The rating agencies downgrade us because they think our political system is broken at an impasse, therefore no solution is occurring. And our argument is the way to break that impasse is to start budgeting. The law says we should budget. We should follow the law. We have, dis we have disagreements on how to budget. But at least we ought to come to the table with each of our ideas and our plans. If you're ever going to get to a solution, what usually happens under what we call regular order is we pass our budget vision, the other side passes their budget vision, and then we've brought ideas to the table and we start negotiating. That hasn't happened for four years because the Senate has chosen not to even begin this process. And so we think we are advancing the goal of restoring fiscal discipline to our federal government by just getting Congress, the House and the Senate, to begin to follow the budgeting law again to budget. Now, at the end of the day, we hope this will result in getting a down payment on our debt problem so that we can continue to meet the obligations of our seniors, of, of our military, of the people who are living on the safety net, of the vulnerable, of the bond market, so we can keep interest rates low so that we can make sure that we don't hurt our economy. I, I want to uh, commend you and all involved on the effort to try and get people just put out a budget. I think we all know, with all due respect to my friends on the other side, their last year in the majority, they chose not to do that. I think they chose thinking that would provide some political cover. It clearly didn't. Uh, and I think that's what's gone on on the Senate side. I think this is a political calculation that somehow this will spare some of our members from <coughs> difficult votes. Uh, I'd commend you for developing a difficult budget and uh, and uh, getting your colleagues to vote on it. And it was a legitimate issue in the campaign. I have no problem with that. I think that is an appropriate place to have these discussions. You come, you vote, we go have a campaign, and that helps the country clarify the issues. We move on. 
uh, the House uh, has fulfilled its responsibility in that regard in the last two years and went through the fire in the election, and I think that's fair. The Senate just simply has not, uh, and it is discouraging. Uh, you know, it just takes 51 votes. That's all it takes over there. I've, I've actually heard commentators tell us, oh, no, this requires 60. It takes no such thing. Uh, it just takes 51 votes, and the, where the majority now has 55, and at one point had 59, uh, and were unable to get, unwilling, I should say, to get 51 of their members to do what you got over 228 of our members to do last year, which was actually vote on a budget going into an election year. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm delighted to see legislation like this. I do think there are legitimate constitutional questions. I uh, I think those are that we'll probably have a vigorous discussion about that uh, in the next couple of days. I'm I'm comforted by uh, some of the precedents you cite, Chairman. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is just about getting us to do our jobs. And there's not a member up here that wouldn't tell you it really is our obligation to write a budget. Again, our friends in the majority did not. I'm really happy to see in the minority they've chosen to do so. I think it's actually a very good thing. Uh, I can tell you when we were in the minority writing a real budget, and laying it out there was a very good thing for us politically. So it's the right thing to do. I think our friends in the Senate need to, to follow course and uh, just simply present a budget. It will clarify the issues. I think it will actually help us avoid future debt ceiling crises. If we know we've got some manageable plan uh, and each side staked out a position, we'll, we'll find some commonality, no doubt, and I think we can move forward. But, uh, you know, until the Senate actually gets in the game, I don't think that's going to happen. And I do think that's playing fast and loose with the credit of the United States for political reasons. So, again, I commend you very much. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Cole. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, Mr. Chairman, you talked at the very beginning uh, of your remarks about a, a deliberative process, how important that was. And, um, uh, and uh, Mr. Ryan talked about uh, regular order. I, I mean, and I'm, we're all for that, uh, but we're beginning not with a deliberative process, and this is not regular order. I mean, this is this is not the product of a deliberation in the Ways and Means Committee or hearings and markups. I mean, we're, we, this this really is kind of a backroom deal that we we read about. I first read about it uh, when you were on your retreat. Uh, so we, we we begin on on that note, um, and I think one way to uh, avoid that characterization would be to agree to what Mr. Brady has asked for as an open rule, uh, and I would. You know, ask both of you, uh, Ms. Miller, Ms. Mr. Ryan, whether or not um, you would uh, favor an open rule here, so that we can have a deliberative process, so that you know members who, quite frankly, uh, haven't even read this yet, because uh, again, yesterday when you dropped it in, it was um, the inauguration day, Martin Luther King's birthday. Um, there are questions about constitutionality that people uh, who are not constitutional experts are trying to grapple with. Uh, so uh, would you uh, be in favor of bringing this to the floor under an open rule tomorrow? Well, as a fellow chairman, I, I will defer to this chairman. I, um, I don't want to tell this chairman how to run his committee because uh, a lot of times there are other issues that you just don't know about to take into consideration. Does anyone, do you have an opinion on whether this should be an open or closed rule? Uh, I also will defer to uh, your rules committee to uh, debate uh, after we're done. That's, that's uh, why you uh, have this committee, yeah, I'm, yes. I'm not particularly surprised by your answer. Uh, but, I mean, I, I just think it's an important point to make. And the, and the other thing is, um, you, know, uh, you know, I'm as frustrated with the United States Senate as anybody uh, on this committee. Uh, but I think it is a little bit disingenuous to say lay the entire blame for where we are on, at the feet of the United States Senate. Um, you know, uh, over the last several months, over the last year on these budget negotiations when Speaker Boehner and uh, the President, according to press reports, were coming close to an agreement, uh, and the Speaker walked away on a number of occasions. I doubt he walked away because the Senate didn't pass a budget resolution. It was because that members in your own conference uh, didn't want to compromise. Uh, and the problem with the budgets that have been brought to the House floor that have been passed with your majority have been that they have been extreme, uh, that uh, that and in some cases, they're irreconcilable because they are so uh, extreme. So it would have been better, I think, to begin this process um, truly in a bipartisan way, uh, to engage the leadership of, of, of – have the leadership of your party engage our leadership to go through a, a kind of a committee process, a deliberation, where you did have a bipartisan uh, product. You mentioned that this is uh, Mr. Cooper's idea. 
Um, I looked up the bills. I mean, the bill that you're basing this on that Mr. Cooper introduced doesn't even mention uh, the debt ceiling. And then another bill he did that did mention debt ceiling said if we default on our debts, that congressional pay is kind of the last thing uh, that uh, that gets resolved. So this is this this is different than that. And I, I also want to go on record as saying I, I I do not believe that we should be politicizing the debt ceiling. I guess I'm I should be happy that we're not going to default immediately because we're going to kick the can down the road for three months. But uh, I'm tired of government governing by gimmicks. And this, this is kind of another gimmick. I, I don't know whether or not withholding the pay of senators, most of whom are multimillionaires, is going to really be a big deal. But, you know, but, it, it, but that's not the way this, should, this process should work. It shouldn't be about gimmicks. It shouldn't be crisis to crisis. And so I, you know, I mean, I, you know, this will be brought to the floor tomorrow. But I think that if we want to start off on the right foot, uh, that it, I think it would be important for this committee uh, to have an open rule, given the fact that this is uh, being brought to the floor and, uh, in a very, uh, ra I'm, I'm going to vote for an open rule, but I, I was hoping you could help convince those guys to vote for an open rule, but you're not going to help me, I guess. So, um, yeah, well, okay. Well, anyway, I, uh, I, I thank you for your testimony and uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow on the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Governor. Mr. Bishop? I, uh, I came in late. Do you think you could summarize for me what's all gone so far? <laughs> we've, uh, we, we, we've had four witnesses today. Let's see. And uh, we've had two that agreed with each other and two that disagreed with oh. each other. Well, so we're still a tradition uh, out here. We, we will continue that look, today. I, look, let me do this very quickly, because I, I have heard, just in the short time I've been here, presuppositions of what actually we will and will not do. So I understand uh, we haven't done a budget yet for this year. That's correct. It's due April so 15th. This bill doesn't presuppose what the budget will or will not be. Correct. It doesn't presuppose what the Senate will or will not. Correct. It just says there has to be a budget. That's right. And in order to do Which that. the law requires. And that's strange. <laughs> Actually following law. That's a unique concept around here. And, and it will allow for a debt ceiling uh, to go forward for a short period of time. That's right. Enabling us to do some kind of budget. That's right. That's right. And there is no presupposition of what that budget will be. That's correct. Just that we will have a budget. That's right. Sounds rational the, to me. The, Thank the, you. The, pay, the, the gentleman says it's a gimmick. We just think it's doing our job. And, you know, when I grew up, I had a lot of jobs. And I had to work to get paid to do those jobs. And so when I flipped burgers at McDonald's or mowed lawns or painted houses, I did the work, then I get paid. I didn't get paid if I didn't do the work. It's the basic concept we're trying to apply here. Do your work, you get paid. If you don't do your work, probably you shouldn't get paid. Now, we have constitutional issues. That's why the escrow uh, concept. The, the more important issue, though, to me is, is not whether. After all, I, I read three more letters that came in over the weekend. So obviously, I get my pay for life as soon as I'm elected for the first time. <laughs> However, for the record, <laughs> for the record, you know, that's false, but that is what I keep hearing. The key issue is we'll get a budget. We haven't had a budget for a long time. This says we get a budget, and it doesn't presuppose what that budget is. I think it's cool. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Bishop. Two other points that we might make. One, we don't know when the actual date is that we would be aiming where default theoretically could occur. And so what Mr. Ryan, uh, Mr. Brady, Mr. Levin, and Ms. Miller are here to do is to push a bill early enough to where we presuppose the work that needs to be done so we can work at this also because we placed on the Senate the same thing we placed on ourselves a responsibility to get this done and that Mr. Ryan has said that he will produce that budget according, accordingly and so we'll be thank prepared. You. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Hastings? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I thank all, all of uh, all the witnesses for their testimony. I genuinely believe that our friends and colleagues in the other body must be very amused uh, by this exercise. Uh, quite frankly, the 113th Congress is starting uh, with the way the 112th Congress ended. During the Summer Olympics, I made the comment that if kicking the can down the road, which is what we are doing, was an Olympic sport, then the United States Congress, and by that I meant the Senate and the House, um, uh, would win gold, uh, 
silver, bronze, and aluminum because we have this notorious habit of kicking the can down the road. Or a Republican philosophy seems to be why, why do now what we can do later and why do later what we can do even later? Well, this is no way to address our fiscal challenges, and it's no way to manage the world's largest economy. Um, from a political, ideological point of view, you lost a lot even when the Koch brothers, through the Tea Party group they fund, Americans for Prosperity, have come out against using the debt ceiling as um, leverage rather than calling it hostage. I'll change it to leverage. And yet the Republican conference is still in turmoil over whether this is the right thing to do. The bill suspends the debt ceiling until May. It doesn't raise it. I guess it is to, this is to avoid um, uh, my friends on the other side from having to coordinate with the Treasury Department on how much of an increase is needed. And I was fascinated by Ms. Miller, Ms. Miller's uh, comments regarding the escrow and whether or not interest uh, uh, would be undertaken. I was looking at the 401k uh, maneuver for $150 billion taken out of the 401k of, of the plan of uh, Congress and federal employees. And the first thing that came to my mind was, okay, if you're going to take $150 billion out, and I don't have very much money over there, but certainly you're going to give me some interest when you put it back and make it whole. And if it ain't but a nickel, if it's a penny, it's mine. And somehow or another, uh, that seems to be uh, a, a problem uh, here as well. Um, but being out of sight doesn't mean being out of mind. And the Republicans can't will away our national responsibilities just because it conflicts with the ideology of uh, some of your more extreme members. I imagine it come May. My friends on the other side will find yet another loophole that allows them to pay off uh, the debt ceiling for another three months. And so we we'll alert from almost crisis to almost crisis through the next two years, while at the same time, you are notorious uh, on the other side for complaining that the problem with our economy is uncertainty. I've heard that more times than a little bit both uh, here in this institution, in the Rules Committee, and uh, those uh, that were on the political trail. Now, I agree uh, that continuously threatening to default on our national obligations is a serious breach of economic certainty. Uh, but Republicans seem to be attracted to this kind of dangerous uh, political gimmickry, to act seriously on ensuring the full faith and credit of the United States. And until they do, I suspect that we'll have a lot more rule meetings on this very issue. Now, as a lawyer, not a constitutional scholar, having made a lot of decisions about constitutionality uh, as a federal judge, and when I went on the bench, I was accused of being a judicial activist. And when I was thrown off the bench, I was accused of being a judicial activist. And I guess that's compared to strict constructionists. And if there was ever a case for strict construction, the 27th Amendment was not ultimately ratified until 1999. Ms. Miller is correct. James Madison proposed it in 1789, and 39 countries eventually uh, ratified it. Um, and 1992 is not just so long ago, so it's real easy to read. It says, no law. It's the first two words, no law, with a comma, varying, and this is where Mr. Brady's uh, staff and persons uh, that he's conversant with uh, must have uh, tagged uh, the word varying 
or the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect, <laughs> and I find this amusing, until an election of representatives shall have intervened. Uh, we just got over one, so you can't do nothing until we have another one if you read it as strict construction, but no law. Now, we've had some cases. We had um, Boehner versus Anderson. That was a district uh, court of appeals case um, uh, where we were talking about the cost of living adjustment under the uh, ethics provision. Um, and uh, then there was another case uh, in the Clinton uh, period. Um, uh, uh, Clinton. Gentleman, Jim, Jim, yield for one yes. moment, please. Of course I will. Uh, thank you very much. The uh, gentleman, Mr. Ryan, is expected to address our conference at 4 o'clock. I hope as, he makes it, Mr. As, Chairman. As the main contributor, and I would like yeah. to uh, ask unanimous consent that as we allowed Mr. Levin to leave, I have no problem. We'd allow Mr. Ryan, but I wanted to give you a chance before I excuse Mr. Chairman Ryan to see if you had a question for him. I do not in, in any way intend I'll to talk, stop the gentleman. I'll talk with Paul about my question. And Thank I you very much. To to the gentleman, Mr. Office. Ryan, uh, is excused. Mayor. The uh, gentlewoman uh, with Mrs. Miller would also like to see that opportunity. Well, <laughs> you know what? You know what? All right. Well, perhaps we may or may not want to have that debate. Uh, the gentlewoman is ex seeking to be excused, and I would allow, uh, based upon uh, unanimous consent, to do that. And the gentleman, if the gentleman chooses to leave at, at his own, uh, uh, then, then I would understand that. The gentleman be excused. Gentleman, Mr. Hastings, recognized. I thank, thank, thank both of you for being here. Thank you Mr. very Mr. much, Hastings. Mr. Chairman. I, uh, you could be like Clint Eastwood. You could ask the chair a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was up to uh, saying that uh, if we look to federal opinions for added instruction, uh, then Schaefer versus uh, 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 Clinton um, was a 1999, 1992 case. Um, uh, but there's been no Supreme Court opinion with reference to this varying business, and all of the uh, federal law seems to deal with just the cost of uh, living increase. But what this proposes uh, is silly. Um, first off, uh, it, 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 if I take Paul's, uh, uh, Ryan's comment, that it's going to cause them to don't be paid for not working, then that makes the absolutely dumb assertion on um, an assumption that the Senate doesn't work. It's dysfunctional, but they go to work, and if we're going to withhold their pay because they haven't had a budget, then I guess we're going to withhold their pay because there are 95 federal vacancies in the United States courts of this country that are not undertaken. I guess all of that uh, work they've been doing or uh, trying to confirm uh, uh, the president's appointees is not work. Uh, and then the thing that goes ignored is how powerful any one senator is. They can hold up anything. And this ain't going nowhere. So all we're doing is poor can. Uh, I, 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 we must have other cans uh, that we utilize because we're kicking um, uh, uh, this one, metaphorically, um, uh, too much. Uh, it's disappointing, Mr. Chairman, that there was no hearing on this measure. And Mr. Ryan made the comment uh, that we want to be transparent and we want to do these things uh, out uh, and not in backroom deals. Well, this is a backroom deal. Uh, it came from somewhere. It didn't come from the committee structure. And it didn't come from what we refer to as regular order. Uh, and now we're going to do it on a closed rule. I remember when I came here, I was so surprised how much Republicans uh, were on radio at that time in 1993, just arguing about Democrats not allowing uh, for open rules. And Democrats and Republicans since that time have done the same thing. At some point, we have to let this Congress work its will. And until we do that and stop playing games, uh, then we are dealing with um, uh, uh, this nation's full faith and credit. And we should really, really not be tying a debt ceiling 
uh, to some ideological concept about uh, uh, budgetary uh, that everybody knows that all of us have had a hand in uh, for political purposes at some time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I, I might also note that uh, about half this Congress is two terms or less, and that we uh, in Republican leadership listened to our members who wanted to have a chance to make sure that we did look at the budget moving forward. And so we were listening to a number of our members and uh, believe before we have to act that we know what we're doing and uh, offer the same uh, challenge to ourselves to do a budget also. Mr. Chairman, may I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, have you ever voted for a continuing resolution? That I have. Yeah, you see, we all do, don't we? Uh, and the same opportunity exists for anybody to vote as they well choose. The uh, gentleman, Mr. Woodall, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, agree with my colleague from Florida that the time from game playing is, is, uh, is long past. I, I would uh, disagree with him, though, that we jump from almost crisis to almost crisis. I'd tell him that we're in a most certain uh, crisis. And if the chairman of the Budget Committee were still here, he'd uh, tell you that same thing. We had a hearing in the Budget Committee uh, last cycle uh, with uh, economists from the left and economists from the right. And the economists from the right said, you're two years away, America, from a serious debt crisis uh, from which you will not be able to choose your own fate to recover. The economists from the left said it's five years away, but it was a most certain reckoning uh, of fiscal policies of both parties uh, for decade upon decade. Um, I'd tell you, I'm as much of a fan of open rules as, as anybody. I'm proud that, uh, that this committee brought open rules back for appropriations bills uh, in this past Congress. I hope that's a tradition that uh, uh, the chairman will uh, will continue, and I'm sure that he, uh, that he will. But this so-called backroom deal is the one that the ranking member introduced the Statement of Administration Policy for, where the President said he would not oppose H.R. 325. This so-called backroom deal is the same one that, that Senator and Majority Leader Harry Reid came out today and praised the House uh, for taking up and moving forward. So at, at some point, when we're dealing with really serious <coughs> problems, and I, uh, I'm candid enough to say some of the problems we deal with in this committee are really serious, and some of them not so much, uh, this budget issue, serious challenge. Uh, you go back to look at what we did in uh, the Budget Control Act, August of 2011, 95 Democrats <coughs> voted yes and 95 Democrats voted no. It was about as bipartisan a, a bill as folks could have come up with. It made a real turn in the spending curve in this, uh, in this country. I was proud to support that, uh, that bill. We can either try to jam something through in three and a half weeks, because I can tell you we don't have the votes on our side of the aisle to pass a, a, a debt ceiling that does nothing about the real problem, that does nothing to, cars, to, to deal with the real crisis, the certain crisis. The votes aren't here, and I'm glad that they're not. It's an irresponsible thing to do to, to kick that can down the road. But what we have been able to do is say, let's give ourselves four months through a serious budget cycle, a budget cycle where the Senate says they want to pass a budget for the first time in four years, and see where those goalposts are, see what our priorities are, see what our values are, and see where that low-hanging fruit is where we can come together and work on something. Mr. Chairman, I'm, uh, I'm sad that our, our, our witnesses uh, have left us, but I'm glad that they uh, were able to testify to the, to the opportunities that this provides. And I, you, you look for those numbers of things that the, the President agrees on, the Senate agrees on, and the House agrees on. They are few and far between. I hope the House will seize this one tomorrow. You Thank you very much. By the way, there's been a discussion about why we're here at this time. I chose to do it rather than doing it at 9 or 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I chose that we could probably uh, take a, a gamble or a risk and uh, know that some of our members may have to go. I apologize for them not being available. I believe it's a responsible thing to let Mr. Ryan go. Mr. Brady's request, Ms. Miller, they will be representing uh, themselves to their appropriate uh, bodies. And so I thank the gentleman. Mr. Nugent. Mr. Chairman, I do appreciate that you didn't have us here at midnight tonight to talk about this issue. It was only a passing consideration. I understand. Well, I understand, you know, not the last Congress, but the Congress before that was commonplace. Uh, so I, I do appreciate it, and I would think members on both sides of the aisle would appreciate that. 
It's interesting, and, and my good friend, Mr. Woodall from Georgia, mentioned it, but it, it is the, the debt crisis that we have. Both sides agree to it. Both sides. And when we start talking about how do you actually resolve it, those on the left had said, we need to raise taxes. Well, they got partially what they wanted when the taxes went up across America and individuals. So they got part of what they wanted. Now, the other part is really, truly, spending reduction because, and I, I know the president doesn't necessarily agree that we have a spending crisis, but we do. The economists say that. It's the reason, and I, Mr. Ryan had mentioned it, when those agencies talked about our underpinning as it relates to our overall health of our economy, they talked about Congress's inability to do two things. One was to raise revenue. That just occurred. But the other one was to actually get our spending under control. And while this doesn't do it, and I agree that, you know, this body, and it doesn't just in recent history, but over, looking back over the years, that this body has kicked the can down the road. And that's why we're in the, pro the position we are today, where we're putting, adding trillions of dollars of debt as we move forward. So while this is a small movement, and while it doesn't sound like much to get the Senate to actually do it, and I know it's by law they're supposed to do a budget, but there's, but there's in that law there was no slap if you didn't get it done. It's just that we just expect you to do it because you're honorable people. You do what the law requires. This is just saying to them, hey, listen, do your job. Do your job. And I don't know what the constitutional implications are because... I was just a cop. But at the end of the day, if you look at the reason why, why this amendment was first put in place, it was because they didn't want members of Congress getting elected and all of a sudden giving themselves a huge pay increase. That was the intent. So they postponed it, that you could vote up for a pay increase, but it wouldn't affect until the next Congress. So as we move forward, it is really about getting the Senate to get off their duff and to join the conversation as to how we're going to get this country back on track. And so I appreciate all of our members that spoke today, and I appreciate you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing this discussion to go on. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. You know, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Woodall, is our representative from at least the majority side to the Budget Committee. And when I had that wonderful duty a few years ago, I recognized it was an opportunity to engage the administration, whether you agreed or disagreed with them, to give them an opportunity to hear from Congress about what we viewed the people would be interested in funding, holding them accountable, giving them a chance to talk with us about they, the needs that they saw, and to make sure that we had a two-way dialogue between the administration it's not just some political document. It's a real live document that uh, our government needs uh, if they were going to effectively work uh, under the law with uh, an understanding about what were they, they were to produce and what, they, what results they have. So I agree how important this is in our work today. And that's why we are taking this time during the day to do this. And I was delighted to bring as quickly as we could. Mr. Webster. Uh, no, Mr. Burgess, Dr. Burgess. Well, I thank the chairman for the recognition. I'll just say for the record, uh, the ranking member brought up the concept that she was glad to see that the dollar-for-dollar dollar cuts were left out of this. I'll just go on record as saying I'm disappointed that the dollar-for-dollar dollar cuts were not a part of this. And yet I understand the reason that that was left out of the legislation. I do have some concerns about the fact that the debt limit is suspended without an actual dollar limit. I hope that can be addressed in the next several hours before we, we vote on this legislation. But I understand that this is one step of a four-step process, and for that reason I intend to support the legislation as it goes forward. And I'll yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, seeing that we have no further witnesses there before, the committee on this issue without objection here in portion of this uh, meeting is now closed.
The uh, chair will now be in receipt of a motion from the gentlewoman, the vice chairman of the committee, Mrs. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee grant H.R. 325 to ensure the complete and timely payment of the obligations of the United States government until May 19, 2013, and for other purposes, a closed rule. The rule provides one hour debate with 40 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on ways and means and 20 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on House Administration. <coughs> the rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the amendment printed in the Rules Committee report shall be considered as adopted and the bill as amended shall be considered as read. The rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill as amended. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. I uh, thank the gentlewoman. Is there any discussion on the amendment to the rule? Uh, gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have an amendment. Uh, I move that the committee grant H.R. 325 an open rule so that all members have the opportunity to offer amendments to the rule on the floor. I do that in the spirit of the conversation we've had here today of the necessity for open rules and also the conversation we've had here today that most members of the House have been shut out completely from this bill. So to give them an opportunity to express themselves tomorrow on how they feel about this matter, I really urge that we consider an open rule for something as important as this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any further discussion? Uh, I would offer some bit of content that uh, this is standard closed rule and it provides for one hour general debate. We're going to move it to the floor. We'll allow both the Ways and Means Committee and the House Administration Committee a chance to uh, debate this. Uh, as the gentlewoman knows, when you go and open up a tax bill uh, like this, or at least the implications of that, it, it has wide-ranging effects. I respect that. I know the gentlewoman uh, understands that. This, I think, is a five-page bill that we have known about that is straightforward, that provides equal context to the House and the Senate, and uh, this is just the first step in perhaps what could be a longer process, and so I would uh, urge a no vote. Uh, hearing no further question, the court, hearing no further discussion, questions now on the amendments. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Uh, well, what, gentlewoman's, we yeah. I, we are, on the, on this yeah. and all those opposed, no. no. We have the roll call. Uh, gentlewoman's request roll call vote. Gentlemen will poll the committee. Ms. Fox, no. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Webster, no. Mr. Webster, no. Ms. Ross Leighton, no. Ms. Ross Leighton, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, no. Ms. Slaughter. Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern. Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings. Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report. Three yeas, eight nays. The amendment is or not. Nine agreed. nays, excuse me. The uh, amendment is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Seeing none, uh, we now will. Uh, Vote in favor of the uh, amendment uh, offered by the motion offered by the gentlewoman from uh, North Carolina. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. Roll call, please. Uh, gentlewoman is seeking a roll call vote. Gentlemen, uh, would uh, please. Ms. Fox. The committee. Aye. Ms. Fox, aye. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Nugent. Aye. Mr. Nugent, aye. Mr. Webster. Mr. Webster, aye. Ms. Slaughter, er, Ms. Ms. Ross Leighton, aye. Ms. Ross Leighton, aye. Mr. Burgess, Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Slaughter, no. Ms. Slaughter, no. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings, Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis, Mr. Sessions, aye. Mr. Sessions, aye. Clerk will report the total. Nine yeas, three nays. The yeah, motion is agreed to. Uh, I will be handling this uh, for the majority. And Mr. McGovern will be handling this. I want to notify the uh, committee that we do not expect any other meeting this week. And with that being said, I want to thank the committee and the staff for their time today. I recognize there are lots of things that people need to get after today, and so this committee hearing is now closed. <laughs>